You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And we are back. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone, doing our second show here on Wednesday, joined once again by Dr. Nicholas DiDonato, an Eastern Orthodox theologian, well, especially metaphysician. Uh, I believe that's where you have your, your doctorate. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. And and it's great to have you back on the show. How you been? Thank you. I've been well. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, honored to do it. And you'll also be one of the presenters for the upcoming um, Catholic and Orthodox conference that we're going to have here on Reason and Theology. So excited about that as well. Yeah, and me too. Kinda, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and, and it kind of ties in with what we're dealing with here. I mean, of course, the topic of the conference is going to deal with <clears throat> points of division still between Orthodox and Catholicism with the intention of... <clears throat> what can we do to fix those, right? What, what can we do to bring about unity? So what, what still divides us? Um, and we ask that question so that we can know, okay, well, how do we move forward for reconciliation? So I'm really, re really looking forward to that. And related to that, we're, we're doing here some of your concerns about the papacy and Catholicism, but not just concerns. I mean, areas that you would find also in commonality with the Catholic perspective but also some points of departure where you would say, okay, I think there's there's a difficulty here that needs to be worked through. And I think it's important that we have both of those because often today we we tend to get discussions that it's it's one or the other. We tend to get one-sided discussions where it's either nothing but a focus of what we have in common and we then never discuss our differences and how to work towards reconciliation. Um and on the other hand, you find people that all they do is they just want to criticize each other. And it's often in a very toxic environment. And, you know, there's just nothing that the other side does right. And it's just nothing but criticism. So I, I kind of want to avoid that and, 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 and have a little bit of both. So uh, that's what we're going to do here today. So, <clears throat> I mean, you, you can just kind of take it wherever you want to go. What would you say sure. is maybe the biggest... Um, uh, point of concern that you would have with the papacy, but then also some of the things that you think that there's points of commonality with the papacy. Well, if it's okay, I'll start with the commonality. It seems like yeah. a, a good place to start. Yeah. So first that, you know, the Pope is the head bishop. He should properly be the leader of the church. And that does go back. I would readily admit that it goes back to, to St. Peter. Mm -hmm. And there is something about St. Peter's office that is unique. Yeah. So I so I think all, all of that is, is correct. And I would even go so far, maybe any Orthodox listening would not agree with this, but it would go so mm -hmm. far as to say there have been saints of the Orthodox Church who recognize papal supremacy in a very strong sense, mm -hmm. even more than I would probably be willing to grant. So <laughs> yeah, my pre, go to pre example of this is yeah. yeah. Go go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So my go to example is, is St. Ignatius of Constantinople, <clears throat> right? The person who preceded and then succeeded St. Photius. You know, it's kind of a complicated situation. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but yeah. It's where it was Ignatius and Photius, and Ignatius and Photius for the patriarchs of Constantinople. I would argue that St. Ignatius was very pro-papal supremacy, mm -hmm. going so far as I think it seems to me at least, and again, someone correct me if I'm mistaken, to recognize the Pope's jurisdiction even over Constantinople, mm -hmm. which is something I personally would not grant. But just mm -hmm. saying he's a, he's a saint of the church, I'm obviously am not. Right, just so that there's a diversity of views in the Orthodox tradition from mm -hmm. very strong papal claims and then others like Photius, right? Are quite, quite obviously. Yeah. But in that, that same exact claim as his <clears throat> predecessor. But, the, but see, the case of Photius is interesting because <clears throat> although in 8, 867 he, he wants to sit in judgment of the papal see and even attempts to yes. depose the Pope, um, he then later, it seems, accepts. I would say the the essence of the papal claims. Now I know some people might offer pushback there, um, but it sure looks like he's accepting the substance of the papal claims, even though he he does offer some emendations to some of the letters from the Bishop of Rome that is sent his way. He, he does do some yes. editing there. Yes, he um, does. But still, even with the edits, the essence of the papal claims are there, and so it's like, well, Photius seems to have accepted the papal claims. 
but then at other points in his life, he, he seems to have in, in a way rejected them. Um, so yeah, the case of Photius is certainly a curious one. Yeah. Um, in the case that whole council is curious, if I could pull up, oh, if I could find it, mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. which one is this? Uh, is this 879 or 879? Yeah. Canon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Canon one. The mm -hmm. wording is, I won't read the whole thing because the wording is mm -hmm. kind of long. Uh, but yeah, uh, if I could find the right part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It says, all, all those persons, on the other hand, whom Photius or Most Holy Patriarch has condemned or may condemned for excommunication or disposition or anathematized in any diocese whatsoever, whether clerics or laymen or any of the persons uh, who are priestly ranked, are treated likewise by the Most Holy Pope John. So in other words, what Photius has done, Pope John is now supposed to recognize, and previous to that, it said the, the reverse. Right? So it's an idea that what Pope John did Photius was recognized, what Photius did, Pope John was recognized, and of course at the very end it has this lovely vague phrase, which it says, well, because it seems to put Constantinople and Rome on somewhat equal terms because of this mutual exchange. But then it says, in the very last sentence of Canon 1, uh, nothing, however, shall affect the priorities due to the most holy throne of the Church of the Romans. So nothing mm -hmm. is supposed to mm -hmm. infringe upon Rome's priorities. Yeah. Which again is just, if nothing else, wonderful diplomacy, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's saying that. So <laughs> that's, that's what makes the case, I think, so complicated. Because mm -hmm. how do you want to interpret that, right? You can mm -hmm. interpret mm -hmm. that saying that Photius recognized uh, the obviously the priority of Rome but with that, mm -hmm. especially with that last sentence. But there also seems to be in the fullness of the canon some sort of mutual recognition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just, and again, I, I am not an expert. Uh, as an introduction, you know, I studied uh, metaphysics, especially from a mainly theological perspective, right? So I'm not a church historian. So so I'm reading these these documents and just saying, really, yeah. as just an amateur at this, saying that this seems very interesting to me because it seems like both sides could walk away saying we got what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Because in that council, the same council, council that says this is in this statement of faith, um, this, is, this is perhaps too long, but basically it says that... Um, it's not to the authority of the confession of those divine men, and it pulls in it his own invented phrases. And his whole idea is that you're not supposed to add things to the to the creed. Right. But it's phrased very vaguely, right? Right. Yeah. So this again, yeah. so you have no it's skillful diplomacy. So I can completely understand from a Catholic perspective saying, look, in the Fodian Council, even even the last one, right, of eight of mm -hmm. eight seventy nine, you have Photius recognizing that Rome has special place, recognize that he must recognize the same anathemas that the Pope does, he must recognize them. Mm -hmm. And you have kind of this vague phrasing concerning that. But from an Orthodox perspective, you can say, well, look, that's true both ways, too, because it's expected that Pope John also recognize all the anathemas and everything that Photius did. And we're saying that you sh should not invent phrases into the creed, whatever mm -hmm. that means. Right? That would have, it's, that's how it, we want to interpret that. So see, that, that's, that's what's curious. So complicated. Yeah, it gets so complicated because then both sides can say, look, we got what we wanted out of this council. And then what happens? Here we are, right? We're like, why are we divided? Well, it's because of things, uh, you know, I don't know, argue this more in my, in my presentation at the conference, is that because a lot of the things that we think united us, I think under scrutiny, were really more diplomatic and mm. not super substantial. That allowed both yeah. parties to go away happy with, with the results. That, that's a really good, good point. And, and the, the issue with the creed, you know, the curious part there is, Aside from the fact that if strictly applied, um, I, I think you have some other ecumenical councils that would be problematic as far as adding to the creed. But the way that it was to be understood is that, and especially you can see it in the actual language of what they're saying there with the creed, they're talking about not adding anything to the creed unless it's necessary because of some kind of heresy, which is exactly what the filioque was. It was to address an Arian heresy. And so, oddly enough, a Catholic could confirm that canon and yet still say, I still I agree. think that this should be added to the creed. Um, I, I completely agree. That's exactly what I'm saying. If the Catholics mm -hmm. look at that and say, we had no yeah. problem with that. The Orthodox look at that and say, that's what we're saying. But we're walking with very different things. The Orthodox yeah. interpretation, no doubt, is that you cannot alter the creed in this manner, unless and, it's through another council 
or you know, even because famously in the Council of Chalcedon Statement of Faith, they actually affirm both creeds. So they affirm, they affirm there's a Nicene Creed, and then they affirm the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. So we're saying don't change, you know, when they have their canon, don't change the creed. They yeah. have that also, also in Ephesus as well. In Ephesus, they also say, I forget the canon where it's like eight or seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, don't don't uh, alter the creed. Obviously, they knew, though, that they were those two different creeds. And it's just from them both. They say, these are the two creeds. Don't change these. But what does that mean? Right. I guess that's the question, right? right? right. Yeah. What does that mean? Don't change the substance of them the don't substance. change them at all like, like right, exactly changing, right. like give, giving a different profession as far as affirming yes. a different doctrine is, is yeah and, and like i said i think it's a completely reasonable interpretation yeah. of that i'm not saying that's unreasonable no, i'm just saying that from an orthodox perspective though that's not how we read that we read right. that in, in a stricter sense is that the mm -hmm. only thing that could change a creed would have to be either a variant creed by a general council, but then in which case all the other creeds would also be explicitly affirmed retroactively. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not like you change the creed and now you have uh, a different creed. You say, no, I affirm this creed of Constantinople I and the creed of Nicaea I. And then later on, and I affirm the statement of faith of Chalcedon. You, you see what I'm saying? It's like a cumulative process. It's not that we're we're editing and that we just need to affirm this one creed and we're done. It's like, no, we can have uh, modified creeds, but then we understand them to be as a different a, a separate creed and then affirm them um, the whole way back by a council and not, not by one particular bishop. It, it's also curious here with, with Photius kind of re returning to him. Yeah, um, yeah. With Photius, aside from, you know, discussing what he may have thought himself about the papacy, what's interesting is that he knew what John VIII and Nicholas believed about the papacy. He knew that, yes. and he knew yes. that they were making the papal claims, and yet he can still be in communion with John VIII, knowing that he maintains the papal claims. So aside, Absolutely. regardless yes. of what he personally thought about the papacy, it's interesting that he's willing to be in communion with somebody who yes. maintains those claims. And I just kind of wonder if, okay, well, if it was good enough for Photius, why yes. isn't it good enough for us now? Even even if one is willing to go that far with the papal claims, it seems like he didn't think that it was a church dividing matter at some point in his life. Th that's exactly right. Yeah, that that's exactly right. I think, I think the issue comes in when, if the case you have a pope who tries to assert universal jurisdiction or something like that to a bishop who does not hold to that, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. when you start to get some conflicts. Now, mm -hmm. what used to obviously help this situation was having an emperor, because mm -hmm. then you always could just appeal to the emperor, and he would just take care of business, right? Sure. Now, if he's trying to make in good with the pope, right, like Basil I, which is why uh, Fortius was his pope, the pope, right, because Basil I wants to reconquer Italy uh, for the umpteenth time, right, because it's always falling into, into foreign hands. You can't throw an empire without Italy, right, obviously, so go get that back on board. Um, so, yeah, you have these... these, these uh, various political things, or sometimes the emperor is like, yes, listen to the pope, but sometimes the emperor is like, no. Like, a great example of this is, you know, Constance II, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He says, you, Martin, Pope Martin I, you didn't have your papacy verified by me, the emperor. I'm kicking you out. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a, that, that, to me, in my knowledge, is one of the strongest claims the emperor ever made against the papacy, is you mm -hmm. actually have to verify your papal throne to me. Like That has to mm -hmm. be confirmed by me. Otherwise, I'm going to send the army and, and knock you out. N never mind all the times where they try to assassinate the pope, kidnap the pope. You, you get the idea, right? I mean, right. It's, it's not a pretty history in <laughs> no. that matter. But the point is that not in our day, we don't have an emperor to just say, hey, I'm taking a side here. We're keeping the unity of the church because the unity of the church is more important than any of this. We simply don't have that. And and that's the that's the thing because when it comes to other understandings of ecclesiology, I would say that there is a different there there are at least two if, in fact actually there's more than two, but in relevant for our discussions, there's yeah. at least two um, ecclesiologies that are relevant for us in the first millennium. And number one is the one that asserts the papal claims. And number two is the one that would say, um, no, that's not the case. And would be the one that more sees the emperor um, in, in, in a similar way that we would see the Pope, but not exactly. But they would see an ecclesiology that is built around the emperor. My concern, however, is in the first millennium, that may have worked because we had an emperor 
we don't have an emperor today. So for me, the ecclesiology, at, at least the ones that are relevant for us, is, is the papal claims. Um, now, you do have other ecclesiologies that neither one of us would, would maintain, and um, it would be maybe more akin to like the Oriental Orthodox. But for me, uh, there, there's other reasons why that's just kind of out of the picture. So I'm just left with, since there is no emperor, there is no other rival ecclesiology uh, that's extant today from the first millennium, I'm just left with the papal claims by default. But if there were an emperor today, I'd have to give some consideration to that perspective. Right. I well, what do you think about that? Well, I was going to say, could you clarify how there are two ecclesiologies? It seems to me mm. it was one United Church, it was one ecclesiology, mm. Mm -hmm. and, of which the emperor was a part of that. I, I mean, mm. unless you mean the investiture controversy where there was a rivalry between the Pope and the, the Western emperor, right? I mean, that certainly, those are definitely rival ecclesiologies, mm. but I don't really see a rival ecclesiology like in Constantinople I or something, mm -hmm. or Chalcedon. It seems like everyone seemed more or less on board what the roles were, even though they were, like I said, the conflicts like Constance II mm -hmm. and whatnot. I'm not saying there was never conflicts between the Roman Emperor and the Pope. I'm just saying, I don't see a different ecclesiology, though. So I, I guess I would say the role of the Emperor, um, that it, at least that I see in the first millennium, at, at some points, I would say, their perspective and understanding of the emperor would be at odds with the papal claims um, that it would not recognize the, that the Pope has this kind of universal jurisdiction, but rather would give a more prominent place to the emperor. Um, now, of course, in, in the Catholic perspective, even with the papal claims, we still recognize a role for the emperor, but we would say it's not essential to the constitution of the church. And I think that there were some emperors who would have said, well, the papacy in its role is not essential to the constitution of the church. Whereas I would claim there are many popes and saints that would say the role of the papacy is essential. So it's kind of those two ecclesiologies that, that I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing in conflict with one another in the first millennium. And they've become prominent in the second millennium. However, with the Orthodox dropping the emperor from this, this ecclesiology that denies papal supremacy um, and, and would just kind of put more the authority there with the Senate of Bishops and, and with a first among equals. But nobody who's able to really visibly enforce it like the emperor could enforce things. Right. Um, so th that's what I mean. What, what do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's really helpful. I mean. I think the what makes things complicated is that the sense in which the emperor would have had universal jurisdiction is different than the sense mm -hmm. the pope would have that. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And I, and like I said, I agree that there definitely have been conflicts. I agree mm -hmm. with that, saying who's really in charge and, and, and the way we describe. It. I'm not saying it's never happened, but I'm saying as a whole, we have had seven ecumenical councils called by emperors. Mm -hmm. At which the Pope acknowledged the emperor's oh, yeah. right to do that. There's oh, been yeah. times the Pope has acknowledged the emperor's right to even vote for the Pope of Rome. Especially mm -hmm. early on, the early centuries, mm -hmm. that was very common. So, all I have to say is, I think what's different is the emperor is not a bishop, right? He may have been able to preach as Hagia Sophia, right? He may be able to go behind the altar. He was given, you know, special privileges, but at the end of the day, he's not cleric, he's not mm -hmm. clergy. And so, I think because of that, he's able to fulfill a different role. This is why I don't see ultimately them being rival ecclesiologies mm -hmm. because the pope is still a bishop mm -hmm. and he's a very special bishop right mm -hmm. but he's not an emperor mm -hmm. and likewise the emperor is not a cleric well so, would you would you then see then two rival ecclesiologies one that affirms the papal claims and one that denies it in the first millennium yes even among uh, the Orthodox, yeah, I think there's a lot of that's what the Fodian dispute is partially about, right? Yeah. To what extent did Fodius recognize the Pope's jurisdiction over Constantinople? Like I said, I freely concede Ignatius, St. Ignatius did. I freely concede that. Uh, but it's not clear to me that necessarily Fodius himself did. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it gets kind of tricky. And like I said, that's where the emperor would be helpful to go and actually keep the church together. So, so the emperor plays this sort of this like, role as mediator when things are functioning well. And obviously, sometimes the emperor does not do that. It makes a giant mess of things, right? See iconoclasm, right? There's no doubt. Right? I'm not saying this, this is perfect. But I'm, I'm just saying that it seems like the, the pope and the emperor, when the church was functioning healthy, 
they both had their appropriate roles within the church. I didn't necessarily see them clash with each other, though granted that you're right, not every bishop recognized the universal jurisdiction of the Pope. That's why yeah. in these various councils, lots of people had to be retried because the East simply didn't recognize at times the Pope's mm -hmm. jurisdiction in the East. So you had to like retry certain heretics, I think uh, Theodore or something like that, right? This happens frequently though. But, but there are other times where the East does recognize this. It's, it, my point is the East is inconsistent. So sometimes the East is willing to grant, including saints in the Eastern Church, is willing to grant the Pope's universal jurisdiction. And sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, mm -hmm. what also is very common, for better or for worse, is to give the impression as if they do recognize yeah. it when in fact they really don't recognize it. So Which to me is a problem. Letters. It is a problem. <laughs> I agree with that. They were all these letters. The Pope, you know, it's all nice and lovely. We actually have to the grant is that at all what they're telling the Pope, right? Because they don't want to make the Pope mad. It's just. But see, the, to me, that's it's like bearing false witness because what I'll hear is somebody, yeah. some, some people will argue. Okay, well, yeah, they have this really high language about the papacy, but they didn't really believe that in practice. And then I'm just oh, saying, yeah, I, that that makes it worse because they're I, now I, affirming something they don't believe. <laughs> I'm not again. My, my whole point is that the ecclesiology is a bit of a mess. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree with everything. I, I agree with all that. I'm not saying that was a good thing. I'm not saying that was a good yeah. thing at all. I'm just saying that there's an inconsistency on the East part in terms of what is the role of the Pope. Mm -hmm. And it varies from very strong papal claims to not really at all. But my, my, my point is that the sort of the glue had been the emperor. Mm -hmm. So if things come to a head, the emperor does not want schism in, his, in the church. He does not mm -hmm. want that. And so he's going to do what he can do, like the, whether it's the occasion schism, right, healed by Justinian, or these various other things, the Photian schism, right? So they're going to step up and try to fix the problem. And well, then what, once that's lost, it's, it's kind of a blow to everyone it's not just a blow i think to the orthodox also a blow to the catholics too because right. then what happens yeah. when you have a, a discrepancy between the pope of rome and someone else now there's no one else who has any kind of real power to fix the right. problem yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah yeah and but what, what would you then say to um those that would claim in the first millennium that the emperor had a um, divine role. Well, not in the sense that every government has, but in the sense right. that he's essential to the constitution of the church because he, he's, he's not there anymore. So I'd have to say that, yes. okay, well that, that one is, is no longer there. Right? right. That view is, is no longer extant. So I don't know how we can maintain it. So, the other alternative is there is that he's just there for the well-being of the church, which I think that I, I would be willing to grant. But my problem is, what if he's not promoting the well-being of the church? What if he's promoting iconoclasm? What right. We do then, yes. you know. Yes. And we, well, yeah. we don't have the church said no, mm -hmm. right? And there were many martyrs because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is. But, this see, is but it seems thing. to me yeah. that it was the papacy that stood fast against the emperor at that point, even when I the agree. rest of the seas were caving in. It was the papacy that. Stood yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with that, but there also I would say even Constantinople, like the Studium, right? These other monastics also held fast. It wasn't. But I agree. I'm not yeah. trying to diminish sure. any credit to the Pope. Sure. But I agree. The Pope absolutely held fast. It was critical at that moment in history, but. I'm just saying that there also were other people who gave their lives in the East to uh, fight the iconoclast heresy. And, it, and it's curious. Some of them affirmed the papal claims. That's what's interesting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, 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 like I said, yeah. I said it from the beginning, I am in no way saying that you can't find saints, saints even, right, in the Orthodox yeah. Church who have a yeah. very, very high view of the papacy. I, I am not disputing that. My point is simply that it's been inconsistent in the East. Yeah. And then when it have inconsistent which really helped keep the unity was the emperor. Yeah. Now, the question is, what happens when there's no emperor? So first, let me answer your right. question directly. Is the emperor essential? Well, no. I think that that, that can't be maintained because right. it's not in the first century, right? I mean, <laughs> Jesus sure. didn't give us an emperor. He sure. could have done something like that, right? But he obviously did not. So it's clear. But to me, it, how should I phrase this? Simply to say, then, it's not the emperor does not mean, therefore, it's the Pope, because like I said, I don't see it as rival ecclesiology, such that mm -hmm. to eliminate one by process of elimination affirms mm -hmm. the other, is mm -hmm. that the Pope actually had a role within ecclesiology. So what we could do something is like try to recover what was the role of the Pope in the first three centuries, right, yeah. before we get to Constantine. But I, it's, I would love to have your input on this. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that 
the understanding of the Pope developed more. I'm not saying it changed, right? I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not saying mm -hmm. that. I'm saying mm -hmm. it got more refined and more clearly understood, especially starting with St. Leo. And so mm -hmm. to me, to go just to the first three centuries would be doing, if anything, the Catholic side a disservice because there are a lot of historical important historical events, especially starting with St. Leo, that you'd want to be able to reference. Sure. You know what I mean? So, and, and especially after, right, you know, 1054 and, you know, into the 17th century, especially, right? That's where the division really, right. you know, becomes something. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because oh. I, I think that's really where there's a just final rupture is, you know, 1750. It was very gradual. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. It was very gradual. So, so uh, if you don't want to be asking. Yeah. So do you think just going to the three first three centuries would be yeah. sufficient? Or do you think there really were important historical and theological mm -hmm. developments in the proper sense of development, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not, I'm not saying change or innovation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. development as in, yeah. as in development uh, start in the fourth century yeah. that you as a Catholic would want to affirm and not just say, well, I forfeit it because it happened too late. See, so I would say that the claims, the, the papal claims and the seeds to them were there even in the pre-Nicene era. Um, I'm granting that. that. I'm granting that. But I was yeah. like, as they were expressed by the West, in a way they yeah. were not expressed by the East. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because yeah. if no one has expressed them yet, then mm -hmm. it's not helpful to say, well, this was expressed later, so I don't want to mm -hmm. affirm that. That's exactly what my mm -hmm. question is. So mm -hmm. I'm saying you'd be limited to the actual yeah. explicit expressions up to the, the what would that in be? In the first the three centuries? centuries? I would say yeah. it's only there in an unpacked way, and it gets more unpacked as the centuries develop and more I issues arise. Uh, that, that's what I'm saying. I, I, again, I, I'm not questioning yeah. the, the, the notion of development. Yeah. Right? I'm, not, I'm not questioning the notion of development. What I'm questioning is, is that development necessary mm -hmm. in terms of a union with the East? Or would you say, oh, you know, all the stuff that has not that's yet been right, unpacked, yeah. I'm willing to concede. Yeah. Hmm. because the East, because no one had unpacked it yet. And we're going to yeah. say first three centuries only. Well, first three centuries only okay. means first well, three centuries only. Now, to me, it seems like that would be unfair to the Catholic position, but I'm not Catholic, so I would love to... Well, we let me put it like this. Let me put it like this. Yeah. For people who rejected Chalcedon, or people yeah. who rejected Constantinople 1, 381, uh, on the deity yeah. of the Holy Spirit, do yeah. you have the seeds of those doctrines, the deity of the Holy Spirit, the Chalcedonian formula, do you have them there in seed form unpacked? Yes. Prior to those councils, you do. Okay. Well, some, some churches rejected them, you know, after, yes. after those councils, if we're going to have reunion with them, would we have to insist that they maintain it in an unpacked form or, or a packed form? Um, you know, I, I, I think that perhaps we could say that you don't necessarily have to use the same language but I think the substance of the proposition has to be maintained. That's the way I'm in the unpacked it. form, correct? And as it was has been unpacked. Not exactly in an unpacked form. As long as the substance of the proposition is there, I'm okay with it. As okay. but again, but does it have to be unpacked and articulated in the same way? I would say no. And what's interesting is um Alfayev, Metropolitan Hilarion Alfayev. Um, wrote an article a long time ago about whether or not the non-Chalcedonians would have to accept the Chalcedonian formula. And what he wants to say is, no, as long as they're accepting the substance of the dogma, even if they're not expressing it in the same way that the Chalcedonians do, right. as long as the substance of the proposition is accepted, that would be sufficient for reunion with the Eastern, uh, Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. And I want to say, you know what? I, I think that that's legitimate. As long as we're affirming it, substantially i guess you could call it in an unpacked way yes. i think that's fine my my only concern is if we merely accept it in an unpacked way what do we do whenever there are practical applications to that dogma right or to that proposition that have to play out in the church practically when it comes exactly. time to use what christ and the apostles gave us with that truth that was handed down when it comes to it comes time to use it in the church what do we do at that point? Is it just sufficient to say it's it's unpacked and we don't have to explain it, or do we just work it out as we as we go along? I don't know. Right. right. <laughs> I, I think it's better than nothing. I mean, if all we can do is have reunion based on an unpacked formula or something, okay. 
it's better than nothing. <laughs> but but what no, do I we agree. do when we get yeah. to those issues, right? Practically, what do you what do you think of all that? No, I I agree with with exactly what you're saying that if the East could articulate what they mean by the role of the papacy in such a way that that could be acceptable to Catholics, I, I think that yeah. would be ideal. And, and I think that language. that's possible because I, I believe that Catholics and Orthodox have the same faith. We share the same faith. I do, however, believe Catholics have unpacked it in a different way. And I I, I want to say the Orthodox have not necessarily unpacked it in that way. Yet we, we right. preserve the substance of what we're saying, I want to say, is still there. That gets a little tricky when it comes to applying uh, this to the papacy, when it comes to universal jurisdiction. Um, yes. You know, but but what what I say to that is, but the but that is there in the first millennium. It's there. And as long as we recognize that it's not heretical in the first millennium, oh, then right. I want to right. say we share the same roots and we share the same faith. But if you're saying, right. oh, no, that which is taught in the first millennium here is just heresy. OK, well, we're not sharing the same faith on that point. No, like I said, I explicitly said, you know, there are saints of the Orthodox yeah. Church that affirm that. Mm -hmm. my, my caveat, though, is that there are also times where it was not accepted. Yeah. That, oh, that's yeah. a tricky thing. So the, the, oh, yeah. the first millennium is a, a very messy picture. So then yeah. we're back to, okay, so what do we do? So we have some right. Orthodox who are willing to accept <laughs> universal jurisdiction and some who are not. Sure. You mentioned Photius. He goes so far as to have uh, Pope Nicholas anathematized mm -hmm. and deposed. Mm -hmm. I thought it was successfully. You, you indicated it was not successfully. I may be mistaken about that. I thought he got Louis II to, to provide the military strength to actually uh, help with that. I could be mistaken. Again, again, it's it's a, the Pope. I'm the, of the Pope that he, um, which was Nicholas the First, I believe, um, yes, was the Pope yes, that he Nicholas attempted to depose. Um, he never even received it. He died before he got wind of it. Oh, he did. Okay, so it was yeah. all I see. We I don't see. even know how he would have responded. Well, we know how he would have responded, but right. he never even got a chance to respond. He died. Because he died um, before it could happen. Oh, I see. That's but what's cool. curious is in 879, there's an implicit canon there that kind of rebukes Photius. Because in 879, there's a canon that talks about not rashly judging the Holy See. And it, it's kind of like that's somewhat there to maybe engage Photius, perhaps. I think it's canon 23. But what's also curious is okay. the context to that canon is, yes, the Pope can be judged, but by a later pope accepting that judgment that's the key not by bishops against the bishop of rome but by the bishop of rome with other bishops sitting in judgment of a previous pope kind of like in the case of honorius um so the, but you know i mean again kind of back to what i was saying here yeah. um yeah you do have some people who deny the papal claims in the first millennium i have no yeah. doubt about it and some of them are even saints um my thing is though but you also have people who are denying dogmas. I mean, you have people who are yeah. denying the role of the bishop, period. You have people yes. that are denying the Trinity and the Chalcedonian uh, formula and all kinds of stuff. So just because you have denials doesn't necessarily negate that this came from Christ and the apostles. So then we have to ask the question, well, okay, well, how do we know that this is something that actually came from Christ and the apostles and not just some kind of error that crept in after the time of the apostles? That'd be something that I'd be curious to hear from you. How, how do we determine if yeah, the yeah. people claims are orthodox or heterodox? Well, again, I, I don't think, so how should I put this? I don't think those are the only options. Like okay. Clearly, if someone were to die the Trinity, Mm -hmm. I don't say they'd be a saint in the Orthodox Church. Someone, mm -hmm. by all means, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a saint in the Orthodox Church who supposedly denied the Trinity? I mean, if there is. Explicitly denied? I mean, you have some yeah. pre-Nicene fathers who were accepted in both of our traditions that did not maintain a perfect standard of, of how Nicaea articulated the Trinity. But that was prior to Nicaea. If they had that's lived after, yes. if they had lived after Nicaea, they, they would have been yeah. straight in their language. Yeah, there is leeway given to those saints. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That, yes. Yes. So I was going to ask, once it's articulated, though, yeah, because certainly the people claims have been articulated, like they have been articulated. But right? you do have, have saints state. like who are Orthodox who rejected the Council, Council of Chalcedon. So you do have Isaac the Syrian and a few Syrian, women, yes, 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 who reject yes. certain dogmatic teachings and ecumenical councils, and they're venerated in in the Orthodox yes. tradition, as they yeah. are in the in the the Catholic tradition in some cases as well. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so it's it's curious because then you do have some saints that deny, however, maybe not obstinately, uh, deny <laughs> certain dogmas. I don't think it was obstinate. If it was obstinate, they wouldn't be saints. But mistakenly, yes. Yeah. So if there's another option when it comes to the papal claims, that that's curious. I'd like to know because to me, it's like I want to know: Are the papal claims um, something that Christ and the apostles handed down or not? If they didn't, I say we we don't need to maintain Vatican I. Um, if they are, we do need to maintain Vatican I properly understood. So then, yeah. So first, let me say, yeah, Isaac the Syrian. That that's a fantastic example uh, of exactly what I'm asking for. So yeah. So uh, thank you for that. I think the difference, though, is you do, we don't have, say, a consistent lineage, century, basically almost every century, of someone mm -hmm. denying uh, the Council of Chalcedon. Whereas I'd argue, pretty much every century, you could find someone who's very highly revered who has issues mm -hmm. with yeah. certain papal claims. Right? These conflicts are not that uncommon, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a there's a little bit of difference there in terms of the consistency. And I mean, Fortius is praised as one of the pillars of orthodoxy because, at least from orthodox well, perspective, because of his opposition to the, okay. the papacy. So that's that's not all to say. That's something that's that's a little bit different than the case okay. of Isaac. Well, let, let me give you a better example yeah. then. Yeah. Um, you have consistent cases of saints denying the use of images in worship. You do have that prior to um, Nicaea II, um, and, and it's very consistent. And I would see that as, okay, well, you, you might say, okay, well, that's prior to Nicaea II. And I would say, okay, well, all this that we're talking about about the papal claims is prior to Vatican I. So it, it's, it's the same thing. You have these consistent denials of something that is later on dogmatized. Um, that's a huge problem for both us Catholics and Orthodox. Yeah. We both have to square that circle, which I think can be done. But we both have to grapple with that because we have saints that would have not understood um, iconodualism as we do. They, they wouldn't right. have affirmed it. Yeah. So is that maybe analogous? I think, I think that's, again, another really good example. I would say that the difference there is obviously the Orthodox don't affirm Vatican I, don't recognize it right. as an ecumenical council. But so perhaps that's the stage where we are right now. Perhaps right. the stage where we are is where the, the status of the Pope to the uh, Orthodox bishop has not yet been dogmatized. And so this is why you have this wide variety of views here and there. And then obviously once it is, if, if it ever is, you know, formally dogmatized, then at that point, it would be improper to have an alternative view. But, but a lot of people don't accept Nicaea too. And so it's like, okay, well, what, what do we do there? You mean nowadays? I, I didn't realize that. That's no, due I mean, to me. I like, didn't know that people nowadays didn't accept Nicaea too. I mean, there's there's plenty of Anglicans uh, who would reject Nicaea Oh, oh I'm saying with Orthodox or Catholics. Oh, well, I mean, as far yes, as... Yes, I'm well aware of that. Yes, that, but, that's not... But that, see, it, that, it, it, begs, it begs the question, yeah. though. It, it assumes that... It already assumes what we're trying to prove. We're already assuming Catholicism and Orthodoxy in the square of Orthodoxy or the circle of Orthodox. We're already assuming that. But that's the question that we're asking. How do we define who is Orthodox in their theology? How do we know who's part of that circle? Is it, you know, so that that's the difficulty. Um, that's what I'm trying to find out is, 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 are the papal claims within that circle of Orthodoxy or are they outside of it? And how do we determine that? Right. So then to answer your, your question directly is I would argue that in the, the first, certainly in the first millennium, it was a legitimate option. It wasn't heretical. So in other words, if you were to affirm the strong papal claims, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be heresy. But at the other, at the same time, it also would not be dogma where this is the only option. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. an option where some people affirmed it and some people mm -hmm. denied it, just like so many other theological points. And I, and I really think that's the difference. So until you have Orthodox saying at a council, we affirm this as dogma, it, it can't be said to be dogma. Just like you said, mm -hmm. Protestants, well, they explicitly reject Nicaea II. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't know, it does no good to say that mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't affirm this dogma. So it, 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 there's no sense inside throwing Nicaea II at, at a, a Protestant or a foreign Protestant mm -hmm. because they don't mm -hmm. affirm that. Yeah, it, it most certainly in the first millennium, we can't say that the papal claims are solemn dogmas. 
That, that's clearly not the case, although we can say that they're asserted at some of the ecumenical councils. I don't think that they were solemnly defined at any of the ecumenical councils in the, in, in the first seven right. councils. Um, the, for a solemn definition, we have to go to Vatican I. Um, that being said, however, uh, such as the case of Nicaea I, that's when you have a solemn definition on the deity of Christ. Yet prior to that, though it may not have been going against dogma technically, to still have denied the deity of Christ prior to Nicaea 1 would still to have been denying something that was taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium definitively. I mean, prior to Nicaea 1, it was taught definitively, though not solemnly in an ecumenical council. So I'd say the same thing. I would say the papal claims sure seem to be there. And I would even say are even being proposed as non-negotiables by multiple popes. Now, you do have a lot of other people who would not think that they're non-negotiable. They wouldn't accept that. But see, that's then the question. How do we know whether or not, prior to the definition, this was something negotiable or not? In the Catholic paradigm, well, the way we know that is that there's this constant uh, consent of the fathers and the bishops on a teaching. That, too, can be somewhat qualified because... We would say that about the assumption, and it's clearly not the case that everyone in every single age, literally to the man, believed the assumption. So here we're just kind of talking about a moral majority. So then we would have to ask the question, is there a moral majority to those who affirmed the papal claims in the first millennium? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yeah, That's a tough one, because I, it, it seems like there's a fair amount that would have probably denied the papal claims. Yeah, and I, I would make a, a slight contention though with this particular knowledge of deity of Christ, because the deity yeah. of Christ, I'd argue, is utterly essential for salvation. If Christ is not yeah. God incarnate, then mm -hmm. so, so, there, salvation is not possible, or right? the divine human nature is mm -hmm. not be mm -hmm. united. Mm -hmm. Now, are you saying the papal claims are on that level where you cannot be saved unless you hold the papal, cla papal claims? Um, because I... Mm -hmm. go, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would I would affirm what Unum Sanctum teaches, and that is that it's necessary for the salvation of every soul to be in submission to the Roman Pontiff to be saved. However, does that mean then I think well, Orthodox are going to hell? No, actually no, because I think it's impossible for a person to have that implicit submission without it being explicit. And here's how: if a person knew, let's say you have an Orthodox, and they knew that th this is something that Christ handed down and he expects me to assent to this. Um, if that were the case and they assent to it, they have that explicit knowledge, they assent to it, great. Let's say they're not aware of that necessity. However, they would assent to it if they knew that Christ actually required it of them. Now yes. you have an implicit uh, assent. I think that Orthodox have that implicit assent, at least most do. Because I think the vast majority of Orthodox, if they knew Christ expected this from them, they would assent to that. They wouldn't say, no, I'm not going to accept something that you passed down. I, I don't think most Orthodox. Yeah, and count me in that camp. Yeah, yeah, definitely count me in that camp as well. So I don't think that it's necessarily an impediment to not have an explicit submission to the Roman pontiff. Because I think that that implicit uh, affirmation is there. And the same thing for the deity of Christ. Let's say you have just some you know, person who's just brand new to Christianity in the second century and just doesn't know a whole lot. Might they know that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, at least the substance of that proposition? Maybe in some cases they would have known. What if they're really ignorant and they're poorly catechized or something? Maybe they wouldn't have. But I imagine that they, if they were truly in Christ, they would have accepted that if they had known that this is actually something that they had to accept. And, and, and so in the case of even prior to Nicaea, I would say that um, as long as they implicitly had a faith in everything that God expects me to assent to, I, I don't think they're putting any barriers between them and God. And I think that that's the majority of Orthodox. Now, there might be some Orthodox that are putting some other barrier in their life. But I doubt very seriously the one barrier they're putting in their life is, no, if, if Christ taught this, I would reject it. I doubt most. Yeah, I really, I would like to think this, right. that's not too common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you, maybe there's other difficulties elsewhere with sins of the flesh or something, but denial and, and a lack of faith um, and heresy per se, formal heresy, I don't think the majority of, of Orthodox have, have formal heresy. Um, but I would say, however, that the papal claims are dogmatic 
And yet I don't think the majority of Orthodox are formally heretical because they haven't yet assented to Vatican I because I think that, that there's that implicit desire to assent if they know that this is something that they need to assent to. And right now I think that the majority of Orthodox have not been given good reasons enough to actually assent to those things. So that level of knowledge is not present. Just merely hearing the claim, oh, these are these are divine teachings or something like that. Just merely hearing that claim is not sufficient to say, oh, now you know. And now you're culpable. That's not the Catholic position. What What do you think? What are your thoughts here? No, I I, I think you know that's correct. This idea, like you said, of implicit cons consent, where if we knew from an Orthodox perspective, right, that Christ did in fact teach this, and yes, we would yeah. absolutely, I would at least absolutely yeah. assent to that. I, I think the important difference is that this particular claim of universal jurisdiction was disputed. Yeah. Very commonly in the mm -hmm. first millennium, right, in a way that the divinity of Christ, if you dispute that, you are clearly a heretic, right? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think there's many ways about that. This isn't just someone who doesn't know any better. There are people who are just either ignoring the Pope, they would appeal to the emperor to try to get their way. Like They just they just were not taking these claims, mm -hmm. or sometimes even the annulments, very seriously. So, and again, like I said, I think there's a diversity mm -hmm. of perspectives. So the question is, Mm -hmm. Is this something utterly essential yeah. to affirm the papal claims? You're right. Unum Sanctum very clearly says, mm -hmm. yes. And I believe you're like that, that last sentence, right? That he, they throw mm -hmm. in there, right? Mm -hmm. It reads nicely. Mm -hmm. That last sentence, like, there you go. Sure. There, there's, there it is. Um, so, uh, but all to say is, yeah, I think from an Orthodox perspective, that a particular, that particular view of ecclesiology would not be necessary, a necessary dogma. It's something that, well, maybe some people can affirm that role the Pope and some people could not, and we're just more or less content, just like we're content to have multiple biblical canons, right? We're content mm -hmm. to have this diversity, and that's just it. Mm -hmm. And as you probably know, uh, that for some people, I find it very frustrating. You know, Orthodox, how do you have multiple biblical canons? How do you have this wide diversity of views on all these things? So some people mm -hmm. really do do not like that. Yeah. And for some people, it's just, well, you have these local traditions, and that's just how things worked out historically. We don't see a need to dogmatize this and say, this is the one view on the papacy. This is the mm -hmm. one canon you have to have, this, et cetera. Yeah, and, and that's a, a much more tolerable you know, perspective. It's going to be different for those who would just say, look, the papal claims are anathematized, period, you know, or the filioque is anathematized, period. Um, that is going to be much more difficult. So I, I appreciate where you're coming from. You're basically saying, look, the papal claims or the filioque um, could be considered theologumenon. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. And 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 that's a much more tolerable perspective, obviously, right? So would that be sufficient, however, for reunion? Um, you know, I struggle with that. I, I want to kind of say yes. <laughs> you know, I want I want to I wanna say, look, when we mean here a theologumenon, do we do we just mean that you're you, do we mean that you can completely deny the substance of the proposition outright, or do you just mean that you can express it differently? What what do we mean here? And and then what what are the core claims that really what's the substance here that really has to be affirmed? I want to say um, the challenge with just saying you know we can just reduce this to a theologian on for for those who haven't yet you know maintained it or something um are they affirming the substance of the proposition and and if not is that sufficient for reunion um i don't know because again we have to share the same faith at least substantially and if this is part of the faith if this is something dogmatic that's handed down in the deposit of faith we i would say we have to accept at least the substance yes so if we mean by theologumenon, well, I can reject the substance, but you're free to hold to it. I don't know if that's adequate as much as I would like for it to be adequate. I just don't know if that's adequate because it would be no, saying, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't, I'll be stronger than that. I don't think it is because this is a practical matter of ecclesiology. If you have a situation where the Pope wants to depose the Patriarch of Constantinople, <laughs> I mean, historically you could say, well, if the Patriarch holds that position, I guess I'll just say, sure. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. Well, because that's basically what happened at arguing the first millennium. Like mm -hmm. they were, the Pope would do things like that, and the responses would differ mm -hmm. depending on the emperor, on the patriarch, and on the bishops, and how yeah, popular yeah, yeah. was the patriarch, and all these other complicated political factors. Like I said, does the emperor want to make good 
in with Italy? Is he after the Bulgarians? Does he want the fence? Right? Does he want to reconquer Italy? They've all these yeah, like, yeah. complicated political factors as well in determining how then is East going to respond, the Orthodox are going to respond to a uh, papal assertion of, of the Pope's claims. So this is not something that can be mm-hmm. that would be up, I guess, in some ways to the Catholic perspective, as I hope mm-hmm. with the Catholics be to just saying, well, you can make these assertions and sometimes it'll stick and yeah. sometimes it yeah, won't. Yeah. And but in but in the case of be a cause for disunion. Yeah. So that's it's well, tough. The, I, I don't think I don't pretend to have the answers to this. So, like in those cases where it doesn't stick, right? It wouldn't stick because the person doesn't affirm those claims, um, presumably. So, okay, then are they then maintaining a different faith? Because ultimately, the Catholic perspective is that okay, you have Peter as the prince of the apostles. Peter is given a place where he is head of the College of Apostles, um, Apostolic College, and um, he has full authority over the Apostolic College, and we and the Catholic would say that um, that position between head and members there between Peter and the apostles is transmitted to the su- successor of Peter the Pope and the College of Bishops, the su- successors of the apostles. So that in the same way that Peter had full authority over the apostles. Um, the Pope would have full authority. That doesn't mean that he necessarily is to in, in, use it in every instance. In fact, in the, in the majority of cases, he should not use that. In the majority of cases, if Peter were to just go to the apostles and tell them, here's what you need to do, do this, do that, that would be an abuse, right? Um, right. Same thing for the Pope. But that's the claim that's being made. So if somebody's saying, no, I'm not going to accept being deposed, to me, it seems like they're denying the claim. And the claim we're, we're saying is part of the deposit of faith. Um, so would you then say it, it's it's possible for a person to say, no, it's not part of the deposit of faith, but we're still within the circle of orthodoxy? Well, I agree. I think that's part of this too, is that yeah. part of the deposit yeah. of faith that Peter had that kind of relationship with his fellow apostles. Right. I mean, obviously as orthodox, I would say, no, it's, it's not to that extent. He certainly is a leader of the apostles. Mm-hmm. Why I'm not even necessarily uncomfortable with the, the prince of the apostles language, yeah. but the idea that he could go around deposing apostles that Paul appointed or something. <laughs> right, right, right. But you, I would say it's well, not. I don't think he could depose no, apostles. I don't think he could do that. You know, uh, bishops, bishops appointed by okay, the apostle okay, Paul. Okay, okay, okay. But but why? But wait, why right. wouldn't he be able to uh, depose his fellow I, apostles? Right, because he was in charge of them and he has the power to depose. Yeah, to depose apostles. These, because these apostles, because they were also. The, because they were personally also commissioned by Jesus, whereas but well, he's now the aren't. vicar of Christ, correct? He's now Innocent yeah. the Third. He's the vicar of Christ. So now yeah. you're out. Yeah, but I mean, at the same not, time, Christ, I don't Christ that himself would stop that. he's the vicar of Christ. <laughs> but 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 Christ Himself appointed those apostles. So I well, just he appointed thought, Judas too. I mean, he, right, obviously, right. So yeah, but but Judas. So we left, could say right? that. <laughs> well, I, I understand what you're saying, but yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is that it could simply be just. I don't see this as a big difficulty. It's just yeah. that. Well, this was a, he was appointed for X period of time, and now he's not. I, I don't see any real contradiction there to say you have a temporary reign as an apostle or as a bishop. People die. I mean, right? So, uh, just to understand, to just to understand, right. you would say the Catholic position would entail that Peter would be able to depose Paul, for example. Well, I'm asking you, I, I'm not Catholic. I don't want to straw man the Catholic I don't position. know if I'd I don't, be I don't willing know. to say that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I don't I'm know saying, if I'd be willing to say that. Yeah, um, it's not clear to me that Peter has that kind of authority over. Yeah. I, I, it's just like the other possible. I don't know out. if he does so either. Paul, Paul, Paul appoints Timothy, right, as yeah. bishop. Yeah, yeah. Can Peter depose Timothy? Yes. Right, right. That's why I think we would disagree because it's not clear to me, at least from the textual, at least from the Bible, that obviously it just would come up, right? This is where it's kind of hard. So we're saying it's a part of the apostolic deposit. We're going to say, no, you're going to say yes. <laughs> and what are we going to do? Right. right. Have the Easter controversy right. over again, where one, right. one person says, no, this was taught by an apostle. Right. And where it says, yep. no, it wasn't. So this, this, this is, I think, exactly part of the heart of the problem oh, yeah. is, this is it. what was, this is which it. was the relation to Peter, to mm-hmm. the other apostles and to the bishops that were then appointed by those apostles. Again, yeah. Freely yeah. Grant, he was the leader of Freely Grant. He is given the keys in a special sense, unique mm-hmm. to him. Uh, so I freely grant all these things. It's not clear to me that any of that entails universal jurisdiction such that he can appoint or depose a, a bishop anywhere. 
Mm-hmm. That's just that's just not clear to me from the New Testament. And maybe I'm sure you have answers to that. Of where, the, where I would only say, I would only yeah. say it's in the New Testament to the extent that it's wrapped up in the commission of Matthew 16. Um, now, if that's wrong, if it's not wrapped up in that commission, then the Catholic claim falls apart. Um, so it really all hinges on. Where he's given the it, keys because uh, yeah. because the Great Commission. I'm confused. The Great you mean the Great Commission? Or you mean the the commission oh, no, of no, Peter in the, the commission of Peter in Matthew 16. Is yeah, with the that, keys. Is correct? that authority, that universal jurisdiction, tied up in the keys? Now, at the same time, I will say all of the apostles are also given the keys. That's but what I was going to say. Yeah. But as Gregory would note, um, Nanzianzus, I believe it was, uh, would note, um, they're given the keys through Peter. Um even, even though they're given them directly by Christ, it's, it's yes. if you will, exercised through Peter. Um, so I want to say all of the, the apostles yeah. have the keys. And in fact, the Catholic Church and an ecumenical council has affirmed that all of the apostles have exercised and were given the keys. Um, but the question is, you know, do, do they have that in union with the Pope and not ever against him? The Catholic understanding would be yes. So. However, he is singled out explicitly in Matthew 16, showing yes, a distinction yes. between him and the rest of yes. the apostles. So then the question is, does that imply a universal jurisdiction? A Catholic would have to say yes. If that's wrong, I do think our claim to universal jurisdiction falls apart. Yeah. I think it falls I, I, apart. I would just simply say it's like I love the example of Gregory Nazianzus. Clearly, a saintly Orthodox Church would seem to suggest yes. My only point is that I also think there are saints that could interpret that differently. Sure. If I'm not mistaken, even St. Augustine in one of his, in his redaction mm-hmm. of that very uh, commentary on that changed mm-hmm. his view on that from. Yeah. He, he basically just says, you know, it's up to you to figure out your whole yeah. able to hold I mean, this view. Yeah, yeah. I, exactly. So uh, he's obviously a saint in both of our churches and he held yeah. clearly, you know, so yeah, he there's, changes. There's I, saints I, that he used deny. to hold it, then he did no longer help holds it. Yeah. So yeah, there, all there's saying, saints. That's, yeah, my position is that I think it's open to interpretation. I I don't mm-hmm. think the biblical evidence is overwhelming for either side. I'm not saying at all that the Catholic position is unreasonable or untenable. Mm-hmm. I just don't find it uh, compelling. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. And, and so this is where we get to the issue of the problem is that it's a practical issue, right? Because right. if we if right. if we disagree on what exactly is going on here with the keys, then what happens? We have practical things like the Pope wants to depose someone. Or the Pope does goes off the rails a little bit, and now he can't be deposed by even a council bishop. Well, I guess we're just stuck with him till he dies. The next Pope comes along and writes the ship. But I'm sure you would grant that there have been some Popes that have done some yeah. less than yeah. ideal things. Of course. Uh, and so th- these are the kind of things that for the Orthodox are like, look, if a bishop's out of order, as we understand at least many of the canons throughout multiple mm-hmm. ecumenical councils, the bishop's out of order, remove him. Yeah, and right. I, and I think that, I mean, the councils. I don't see any exemption made for the pope, or if the pope's out mm-hmm. of order. Well, he has to stay. I don't see any exemption. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know these documents well, better than I do. The, I see all kinds of disciplinary measures yeah. with no exceptions made for the pope of Rome. Well, they there are many, many who would say that the first see is judged by no one um, in in the first millennium. So, at the same time, what does that mean? Because there's a variant of that. The first see is judged by no one except in the case of heresy. Um, so, and I would say, okay, well, 879 talks about not rashly judging the Pope, but in the context, it seems to be referring to a, a later Pope with the bishops judging a previous Pope. So can we talk about a Pope being judged? I think so. Um but the question is, is, is that a living pope? And in what way is yes. it being judged? Exactly. Um, and can there be any pope who could persist in some kind of problematic mm-hmm. error? And then there's basically nothing you can do about it except wait till he dies. I think that is the big problem yeah. for the Orthodox because we want to mm-hmm. hold all of our bishops accountable. I don't want to say any of my bishops can just, well, I guess we're stuck with, I know, I'm in the OCA, Metropolitan, you know, blessed, you know, uh, Metropolitan Tikon. You know, no, if he does something outlandish or heretical, mm-hmm. he's going to be gone. Mm-hmm. And, and for mm-hmm. the Orthodox, I could say we are, I think, relatively proud of it. Not that that's always happened. There absolutely has been corruption, even in the OCA in our short history. But there has been, corru- there has been corruption. Um, 
but there's always that possibility that a council of bishops is going to come and remove you if you cross certain lines. And mm -hmm. I, I think for the Orthodox, it makes it uncomfortable to say that, well, the Pope is exempt from that, especially, like I said, as far as we could tell, that's not in any of the canons. If, you, if there's going to be an exception for the Pope, I don't, I don't find where the exception is made. But see, I wouldn't limit things to the canons, right? Because that's I can't, fair. That's fair. Yeah, because I can't find in the first millennium in the canons the real presence of Christ. I mean, all the the fact that Jesus is the Messiah or something like that. There's all kinds of things in, that isn't in the canon. Yeah, the canon. I think the difference though is that there were so many, as you know, disciplinary problems that came up in these canons, and they were addressed. It's not like the real presence of Christ was one of a like, part of Arianism or something. Then it would have been addressed. In other mm -hmm. words, the problem of uh, errant bishops and heretical bishops was well known, right? They were mm -hmm. they were heretics in the first century, right? Yeah. So the, the the point is that simply it's it's different in that this was a known issue and it was addressed multiple times across multiple ecumenical councils, and mm -hmm. I just don't see exceptions made for the Pope. In the in the case though of the Pope um, being judged in in what sense, I do think we do have eight seventy nine to appeal to, um, so where we we can say. He can be, um, he can be judged not rashly, but he can be judged. Um, but that would have to be by a future pope um, ratifying it at the very least. So, in other words, maybe um, other bishops, perhaps bishops in the East, judging a previous um, pope and the bishop of Rome, you know, ratifying their their decision. I think that that's tolerable. I think we have that, but we don't have so, the. Which can, I'm not familiar with this actually. Which canon is this again? I believe it was Canon 23 of 879. Uh, I'm okay, I will try to look this up. I probably won't do it now live, but I will. Uh, this is great because I did I did not know this. Great. So you said a yeah. Canon 29 of. Yeah, I believe it was okay. 20. Is it 29? Is it 879? Hmm. Because on my list, and I just could have an incomplete list um, here, I, I think I might, I might thinking, only had like five canons, if I'm not right, mistaken. Right, no, so I, I might then be thinking of 869. Let me look it up. Um, which right, is and curious that's the only because, problem for the Orthodox, because we understand that has been overturned by 879. So that would actually the, not surprise me at all if it's 869. The problem, the problem with that is it was only overturned in the sense of Photius and, and Helm being deposed. That was the only thing that was overturned. Um, we would say everything it's, else that it that it asserted hasn't been overturned. But I know that's going to be different for an Orthodox who would say exactly. no, the whole thing is, is overturned. Exactly. But here, I don't think we have this idea of this partial overturning. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah, because then we but just here, call another council and reconvene. But, I mean, but at the same time, whether or not you yeah. accept eight sixty nine is is somewhat irrelevant because what we do have is you have an instance in the first millennium that is discussing the issue of the extent of deposing a Pope. And this is what it came up with in consort with the East, right? Uh, so in consort with the Eastern bishops, here's what they're saying. Um, now, obviously not all Eastern bishops are represented here, but of course that's also the case with 381, you know, the second, uh, Second right. Council of Nicaea. But if you're referring, you say, if you're referring to uh, 869, there are all kinds of councils that were later overturned yeah. and rejected. So we can't say it's representative because then you're going to have all, even iconoclasts and councils. We have to say, well, that represented the East. I mean, this this is why it has to be done with a little more hindsight. So I think from the Eastern perspective, we don't recognize at all the validity of 869. Um, no, right. I I I, under, I totally understand that, but I do think that. But here's the case where in the first millennium, the question comes up where we're having, you know, what we're talking about. And here's what they came to. Here's what they concluded. And I don't see a rival um, canon coming up unless you want to say um, 867 or something like that, just completely judging the Pope. But it's like, but those, you know, Easterners right around that time reversed it just a few years ago. They reversed that. Um, yeah. But I guess you you could be saying like, well, that's that's not legitimate. They shouldn't have reversed it. No, well, I would right? say I would say uh, a couple of things. One is mm -hmm. that you know there's kind of a parallel situation. Like I say with iconoclasm, we have the the robber council that affirms mm -hmm. iconoclasm, mm -hmm. and then a few years later it overturns it. And the answer mm -hmm. in both situations is because of the emperor. You have an iconoclast emperor who wants this passed, and he gets it done. Now, why do you have the shift? Well, because Michael II is assassinated by his co-emperor, or like probably his co-emperor, right? I mean, I know 
there's some dispute of how much Basil I was involved in that. But he probably was involved with that, we could say. So, and again, so now Basil I comes on board. He wants to be in with the papacy. So Basil I, Basil I absolutely goes along with the Pope to get rid of Photius and reinstate St. Ignatius. Mm. So mm -hmm. all, all I have to say is, I think it's it's a little more complicated. And then what happens from an Orthodox perspective is that the, the final sort of resolution of this whole giant mess of 867 and then 869 mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. 879. Mm -hmm. This is what resolves it. So we kind of see those two councils, nope, they're gone. Just erase them, right? Those, those are illegitimate, right? Both to depose Pope Nicholas, like you said, he died. Thank you for that. Like, he died before it could happen. And like I said, to my knowledge, actually, Photius even got the Holy Roman Emperor on board with this because, what was it, that um, he denied the divorce of his younger brother or something, mm -hmm. and that made the Holy mm -hmm. Emperor Ro Holy Roman Emperor mad. So Photius is all prepared. He's, he's all geared up to depose Pope Nicholas. He definitely mm -hmm. thinks that's something the council can do. Uh, but then obviously, but, so on both sides, right? So on the one hand, we're saying, no, we don't recognize that, even though Photius was had all the chips aligned except Pope Nicholas died before he could be anathematized. So, but at the same time, we also reject then 869 with this mm -hmm. with this canon about um, the Pope can be judged by no one except for another Pope. So for us, the ultimate, at the end of the day, we have, like I cited already, canon one of mm -hmm. 879, which basically is very, like I said already, diplomatic, right? It, it sort mm -hmm. of says that you, Pope, recognize what the Patriarch of Constantinople is doing and vice versa, and this is not meant to infringe upon Rome's special privileges and prerogatives, which are, of course, not defined. <laughs> and, very, yeah. So. Well, I, I, I did misremember. It, it is um, 869, Canon 21. I'll read it here in a second. I did misremember. Um, but yeah. but the canon was there to kind of address the issue with Photius in 8, 867. But I understand that you would say that, okay, well, that's that's not received. That's not accepted. Right, exactly. At the end sure. of the day, what mattered was yeah. 879, not 869. Yeah. Because, again, just, just, just as... 867 has equal invalidity as 869. Right? We want to say that sets some kind of precedent because then we have two contradictory precedents. One that says you can depose a pope in 867, and one that says you can't 869. And so I think cooler mm -hmm. heads prevailed at the end of the day and saying, you know what, let's put out this nice, very vague canon one that makes everyone happy, and we'll just walk away from it. <laughs> Very so nice yeah, you, you definitely have two two different views going on here. But here's here's where this is still helpful to the dialogue is on our end from the Catholic perspective, we're able to say that there is a canon that speaks about judging the Pope, um, yet at the same time, not in a conciliarist condemned Vatican I way, though you know, the way that Vatican I condemned conciliarism, not in that way, but in a different way of judging the Pope. Um, we could say on the Catholic end that there there is some precedent for that in our canonical tradition. But, but I'm saying that, that helps build some bridge with the Orthodox. But I know y'all yeah. don't accept it. So, yeah, but I'm saying it's a double edged sword because if you're going to do that, then you also have to look at 867, which was all about getting ready to condemn Pope Nicholas. Like you said, he died, so we don't know how he would have reacted. But the civil point is that they thought they could do this. Right? Oh, they yeah. Oh, they, yeah. They could be done. Oh, I know. <laughs> My point is that yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's a double edged sword because if we're going to yeah. say, well, we want to look at what happened in 867, 869, I, I think you have. works one way, I, 869 works the other way. That's why I'm saying we should just go to 879 and have that sort of be the final word on the well, matter. And 879 has nothing like that canon from 869. Well, the, I guess to make it even worse for Catholics, you have the Fifth Ecumenical Council that sat in judgment of Vigilius. So you, oh, Vigilius. you definitely have them who yeah. think that yeah. they can do that. Yet Vigilius thinks that he's superior to an Ecumenical Council. That's funny. So here you have two the very different views. Yeah, that's at the what very they're same to bring time. up in terms of the confusion. Yeah, well, the Council yeah. thinks they can do this, and Vigilius and the thinks Pope he thinks can do this. Otherwise, it's <laughs> right. It's up to Justinian, and Justinian yeah. just wants to get his way, so we can't. So I mean, yeah, yeah, it's. <laughs> But let me read it's, the canon. That's the way point. It's it's a messy. Yeah. Or how I look at messy. it, it is a messy history. It is messy, it is and I think that, history. and I think that there were people who denied the papal claims. Even some of the conciliar fathers, I think they denied. At the same time, I think some of the conciliar fathers at Nicaea one would have denied the deity of the Holy Spirit, which is why that oh. issue was tabled at Nicaea one and wasn't addressed. Because yeah. I think some of the fathers there, and the Nicene fathers, some of them probably would have denied it. Um, yeah. But here's what the canon says, just for reference for, uh, for sure. those who might not be familiar with it. Canon 21 of 869. 
Um, if then any ruler or secular authority tries to expel the aforesaid pope of the, of the apostolic see, that is the posum, or any other any of the other patriarchs, let him be anathema. Furthermore, if a universal synod is held, and any question or controversy arises about the Holy Church of Rome, it should make inquiries with proper reverence and respect about the question raised, and should find a profitable solution. It must on no account pronounce sentence rashly against the supreme pontiffs of old Rome. Now, you can read that in two ways. It could just in no way pronounce sentence on old Rome, period. Or it can't pronounce a sentence on old Rome in a rash way, but it can in a non-rash way. But then there's also yeah. the third interpretation is, well, it can pronounce a sentence on the Bishop of Rome, not rashly, by the agreement of a later pope, which seems to be the context from what I understand. Um, but, uh, you know, I could be mistaken, but I believe that's what Robert Price, um, who translates a lot of this stuff, I believe that that's his, his understanding from the correspondences that he's read about it. Um, so I'm having to rely on some of his material there. Um, but but it's curious because here we can at least concede to an extent a pope can be judged, but yes, in a qualified way. Maybe not in the way that's in agreement with the Orthodox, but it's 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 a step closer. <laughs> uh, that's but, interesting. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. yeah, and I was going to ask mm. about if, if there's still time. Ooh, I didn't know mm. how late it was. Uh, mm -hmm. About. How how the Catholics understand the Council of Constance, where there seems mm -hmm. to be three popes, right? Because yeah. obviously the third yeah. pope that was supposed to resolve the the uh, yeah. you know the schism. Yeah, yeah. So it, it yeah, that, seems that nope. there has to be because obviously all those popes were alive, right? Yeah. And then so then how how is that to be understood if it's not uh, conciliarism in some sense? Yeah, yeah. So the way I understand, for for instance, Haec Sancta, I don't understand it in a conciliarist way, in the way that's condemned at Vatican I. I don't believe, I don't understand it in that way. Um, but I do understand it in the way that if there is an emergency crisis, a situation where it's not discernible who the Pope is, um, an ecumenical council could come in and arbitrate in the matter. Not in cases where it's clear who the Pope is, um, they cannot sit in judgment of the Pope. Um, but if it's unclear who the Pope is, I think a general council could do that. And I want to say that's effectively how what what Hank Santa is is saying. There's there's some problems with that. Some might say, oh, well, it wasn't received by Martin V. It does seem like there was evidence that Hank Santa was accepted and ratified by Martin V. Um Others might say, okay, well, um, they did teach it, and it was received by the Pope, but it was taught non-definitively. So, so it was just an error, but a non-definitive error. Um, oh, you know, there there is that possibility, but I'm not willing to concede that just yet. I take the position that, no, it did not err. Um, it just teaches in a non-conciliarist way, in a context where there's an emergency, it's able to sit in judgment of people who claim to be the Pope, but we don't actually know are the Pope. Um, that's how I understand Hick Sancta. I know people are, are going to offer some pushback on it, and, and, and that's fine. That's the best that I can do with well, it. Well, I'll just say, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Because mm -hmm. it's saying very specifically, if we don't know who the Pope is, then we could call some yeah, kind of council what, to help what, discern that. And that's different than saying the Pope is heretical or condemning right. the Pope. I actually think it's a really helpful distinction. So, it's like wouldn't Christ off provide something for that scenario when when it's unclear who the Pope is? Wouldn't Christ provide something in the DNA to be able to deal with that problem? Well, of course, I think he would. Well, he did with the College of Bishops. And this is why you have, I think, these two organs, the Papal Magisterium and the um, Episcopal Magisterium, although, of course, the, the Pope is also a bishop. But um, the College of Bishops, you know, and, and the, the head of the College of Bishops, the Pope, I think that this is why we have two organs there. Whenever there's something unclear with one, the other one is able to kind of come in and settle that issue. Mm. Um, so if it's unclear who the Pope is, who the head is, yes, the body is able to come in and 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 discern those things. And it does have that uh, authority then immediately from Christ, as Hey Sancta says. But that doesn't mean that it always has immediate authority from Christ over the known Pope. I don't accept that. I think that would be conciliarism. Right, right. Yeah.
Excellent questions. I really enjoyed this. I, I want to do it again. And um, I, I also look forward to your, um, you know, your, your, your uh, talk for the conference and hearing your suggestions there. But I want to give you the opportunity to have the final word in the discussion. So put out there anything that you want as far as concluding remarks and then also put in a plug for anything that you want to make the audience aware of. Are there any any questions? I have a little bit of time. Um, Y'all go ahead. And, that's fine. I mean, yeah, go go ahead yeah, and I put can... questions there in the chat. Make sure to put them to at Reason and Theology. Um, let's see. Let me scroll through right now. Are you seeing any there in the chat? Well, uh, I'm in the chat. Some... Go comments. Okay. Yeah, go to the comments. Um, usually takes a moment for them to come yeah. through, so we'll give them just a second here. But any questions that you may have for Dr. DiDonato put to at reason and theology. Uh, somebody says, Michael's almost at 20 K. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> almost, almost. <That's> <laughs> it seems like it's, it's yeah. taking forever to get there though. Uh, <laughs> David says, ortho bros, let us unite until then you're Protestants. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Pope Victor, according to Eusebius, excommunicated those Eastern churches that celebrated Easter on the wrong day. I don't know if that was directed to us or just a previous uh, comment, but maybe let me ask then the question. What, what do you think about yeah. the case of Pope Victor? What are your thoughts? Then? Yeah, so my understanding, actually, I, I came prepared for that question. Actually, the copy of Eusebius yeah, yeah. here bookmarked, of course, at book five. So yeah, my understanding is that uh, Irenaeus actually is not too terribly pleased with Pope Victor's response. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, this, this to me doesn't seem to be a clear case for papal authority because uh, Irenaeus, first basically Irenaeus says that when his you know teacher Polycarp went to the Pope, they had a disagreement obviously over the dating of Easter and Irenaeus praises them for basically just making peace. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, well, of course, Polycarp should have submitted to the Pope Right, it kind of leads to the question, why is Polycarp even bothering to go to dispute with the Pope of Rome if the Pope just has this universal authority, I guess maybe to persuade him or something? But at least Irenaeus seems to be happy with their result, which is that they just left in peace and disagreement. So again, it's interesting because for Irenaeus, apparently you can disagree with the Pope on certain matters, and that's okay, you could just part your, your separate ways. And then when it comes to uh, the, the thereupon victor, yeah, this is what Eusebius says. We still possess the words of these men who very sternly rebuked Victor. Among them was Irenaeus. So, so now with, um, this is book five, chapter 24 of, uh, of Eusebius's church history. So then he has an excerpt of Irenaeus's letter, which is lost. So it's the only copy of it that we have is preserved by Eusebius. So uh, it, it seems to be the case that Irenaeus says, look, Pope, you know, Pope Victor, do what your predecessor did. Don't you know? Don't make a conflict out of this. At least that's how I read the the church. Yeah, I, I agree. So, I so I think that it's we not even clear to me. You know, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just saying. I think we even as Catholics can today say the same thing about that Irenaeus says. I think that we can disagree with the Pope on uh, prudential decisions on who to excommunicate. I think we could do that. Yeah. Um, this is a question about Matthew sixteen eighteen. What is your interpretation of it? That's a great question. <laughs> well, again, first, I, I should note, I am not a Bible scholar. So my, my Greek is not, not the best. But uh, as I understand it, is that if you look at it, it is a pun in Greek, right? Petros, but then it's Petros in the feminine. So the question is, what does the feminine Petros refer to? Does it refer to Peter? And if that, what does it refer to? If you go back in the Greek text, it doesn't really have a clear reference. But to me, it seems to be clearly not Peter because Peter is Petros. He's not, he's not feminine. So why, why do you have this feminine Petros? So, you know, it seems to be, I would interpret it either as the, the foundation of the church isn't Peter himself, but either Peter's statement of faith concerning Christ, that is, that he, you know, that he is uh, the Messiah, that is the foundation of the church, or that simply Christ himself is the uh, foundation of the church. So obviously, Jesus isn't a feminine word either. So again, I agree that um, it's a difficult passage to interpret. I am not the best person to ask because, like I said, my Greek is not the best, but it is kind of mysterious because it seems that it would be very easy in Greek to say you want to make Peter the, the pillar of the church. You could just use a masculine noun. It would be crystal clear as day. But to make it feminine without really a clear reference, 
this is what makes it disputable. So like I said earlier, even Augustine, St. Augustine changes his position on this. So it's, it's a difficult question. Hopefully that's some kind of answer. Uh, well, this one's not really relevant, but let's see. Thoughts on the problem from a Catholic perspective of the EO allowing modern developments not talked about in councils like artificial contraception. So I guess like developments or stuff like that. What, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, I think in general, the, the Orthodox Church mainly uses councils to say no to things. This is, like I said earlier, you know, we have a variety of actually canons, especially of the Old Testament. Uh, even the New Testament canon took almost a millennium to get all the kinks we could say worked out. So this is sort of tolerated. So once someone crosses a line, like you're saying with, with contraception, I mean, I agree, that's a very controversial topic. And uh, if it gets to a certain point, I pray that there will be a council of bishops that makes a decision on that. But right now, things are sort of tolerated until the church says no. Oh, there's something I have to correct here in the chat. People think ordinary magisterium opinions and conversations are in fact infallible documents, and they are not. I just in point of fact, uh, ordinary magisterium is not opinions and conversations. Those would be authoritative, unless you mean ordinary and universal magisterium by ordinary magisterium. And in those cases, it could be infallible. Uh, but in no circumstance can we speak about ordinary as far as merely authentic magisterium as opinions and conversations. Those are in no way. Those would just be non-magisterial statements. I had to point that one out. I, I couldn't let that one go. Uh, loved this video today. Also great discussion. Thank you. I appreciate that for the, the super chat. Here's something Thank I you. saw that, uh, that, that I thought interest was interesting. Um, here it is, um, here. I'd love to see you both discuss while representing each other's position. That would be interesting. <laughs> that would be, interesting. That would be, that would be fun. I'll, I'll argue the Orthodox perspective. You go with the Catholic. That would, uh, be fun. I would be, I honestly would be up for that. Have to do a little more research. I don't know the history of the magisterium like, like Michael does. I mean, I, I, I do not know it that well, but I, that would be fun. I that think we fun. should do that sometime though. <laughs> that would really be fun. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, Okay, well, I think I got everything out of the chat, uh, so we'll 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 uh, just I guess end it there. Did you have any plugs that you wanted to put for uh, anything that you're working on or want to direct the audience to? Yeah, uh, I always want to direct the audience to uh, where I work, which is with the the ACCS, the Association for Classical Christian Schools, where we try to bring church history to you know the high schoolers and to have an educated populace there i say that that that's really our goal so you know if your local catholic you know private school is problematic for lack of a better word because some of them have gone a little off the rails which is very sad um, i would say if it's a school in your area it's certainly you know if you're orthodox or reformed protestant definitely check out an accs school especially as the public schools are going in an ever not favorable direction yeah excellent and um you know any anything that you're also working on as far as papers or, or books yeah the papers time? you know my publishing my dissertation is taking forever <laughs> so maybe, maybe i should confess to that so my my dissertations everyone's curious so i specialize in um saint dionysius the Areopa guy and try to argue and bring out his metaphysics and then use that to critique uh, the early modern natural philosophy, the sort of mechanical philosophy and these kinds of things, and try to show how modern science is very much lacking. If someone wants sort of a book akin to that, I strongly recommend uh, Edward, Edward Fazer's was it, Aristotle's Revenge. He basically mm -hmm. uh, does the kind of thing I'm doing from an Aristotelian perspective, but be more platonic. That would mm -hmm. be the major difference. And I love his work on that, in that particular work. Awesome. Uh, any best sources for Dionysius, uh, Joshua? Sure. Uh, Eric Pearl's Theophany is a great, is inexpensive. If you have lots of money, his thinking being is also pretty good. But I, I for one book, Theophany, it's short, it's dense, it's on the money. I also really like that most people don't, uh, especially if your Greek's decent, the, the Jones translation. If your Greek's not as good, you could do the Parker translation. Awesome. I'm going to have to check that out. I've heard it from Pearl many, many times, <laughs> but I've never uh, sat down and read them. So I'll have to check out Theophany. Uh, once again, I appreciate you coming on and doing this. Looking forward to having you on again to do the uh, conference. My pleasure. Thanks so much. We'll have to do that uh, roll swap here pretty soon. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should. 
everybody thank y'all for watching i really appreciate it great comments and interaction there in the chat don't forget to hit that subscribe button that like button share this on your social media also check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me and also one last thing check out the maximusinstitute.com where i'm offering my course on the magisterium understanding the magisterium i think you'll find that very helpful if you want to understand the catholic perspective of teaching authority all right we'll see you later God bless you all.